Coming up next on America's Hope, we'll introduce you to a talented performer of the Conklis. You might wonder what that is. It's an instrument made in Lithuania. We'll show you how she is now accomplishing her American dream. And welcome back to America's Hope. I'm delighted that you're with us this hour. And now we're going to introduce to you a young lady from Lithuania. She now lives in the United States and she is finding that music is her way of getting to show people that there is hope and that it does prevail. Her name is Simona Smirnova, and she plays an unusual instrument that is originally made, and it's indigenous, to her home country of Lithuania. But welcome to America's Hope. It's so good to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Look, I've, first of all, when you and I met, we were talking about music. You had been talking to your, your manager and I believe your publicist, and I overheard this wonderful conversation about the hope that you have for the world through the power of your music. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about music and how empowering it is and freeing it is in terms of giving people hope. Yes, well, music is an amazing tool to spread um, the message of joy, of hope, of happiness. Uh, maybe even problematic message or something like that. We all listen to music, right? We sit in the taxi, we hear music, we listen to it at home, we have it as a background music. Sometimes we go to the shows, we have attentive listening when we're listening to an orchestra or uh, we're in a jazz club. Music is all around and it really, we all had those um, cathartic moments where we feel that music just takes us to a different place, right? So it just grabs our heart and takes us somewhere. So, and especially instrumental music, also vocal music, but let's talk about instrumental music because it's so, it can be, it can mean so many things. And uh, one person can hear uh, a question, uh, uh, sorrow, sadness, mourning, uh, a lot of problematic things in, in the same piece of music as the other person would hear joyful things, right? So it all, it captures us all and we all of course have preferences. So. I chose in my personal calling that music is my way to communicate with people and find connection. And that's what we're all about, right? We're trying to find connection with friends, with family, and with uh, people in, from the wider perspective. So at this point, I always try to compose with sort of context and theme behind. And uh, I've released four albums and all of them had a very specific theme. But now I feel like the most uh, current thing is, is our world, our planet. And uh, I'm very passionate about spreading the world about human connection to one another, to yourself. And because if you connect it to yourself, you can easier connect to the other people and to the world around us, to the nature, to animals, to plants. And this is very important and crucial at this day and age, right? So. If I take this as a mission and I start composing songs about, let's say, recycling, it's a very specific thing, but people don't want it. They don't want to be taught or sort of like uh, taught in certain a specific way. But if we um, kind of flatter and entertain that ancestral side, a part of individual person, each of us inside, it naturally brings us closer to the planet. And if we're closer to the planet, we do not want to harm Yeah, the absolutely. Planet, right? I mean, we have to take care of the planet. And in, in, in your talk like that, you're reminding me of uh, the late and great Marvin Gaye who wrote Mercy, Mercy Me, The Ecology, and he was talking about what we need to do to take care of each other and to take care of the planet. Uh, and, and in doing that, musically, you've been able to do so much. You, like you said, you have four albums. You also have a book that's out now, and you're traveling around the world, uh, born in Lithuania. What made you come to the United States to expand your music? Because you're widely known in your home country. You've performed for the president there, and actually you've performed the, the national anthem here in America. Talk to me about this experience from Lithuania to America. Well, everybody wants to be in the United States, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> but it definitely wasn't my dream from the beginning. I come from very humble beginnings and uh, the idea of coming to the US came only at the end of my undergrad studies. So I come from the village, I played the instruments all the time, I played the Kankles, the Lithuanian folk zither since I was seven years old and then when I studied my undergrad, which was jazz vocal performance, I thought that I need to get better if I want to actually create life for myself make it as a working, thriving career, it has to be something more than just vocal performance studies in Lithuania. So that's why I just tried my luck, I guess, and I auditioned and I got a scholarship and I moved to Boston in 2012, which is 11 years ago, exactly 11 wow. years ago. Wow, yes. congratulations. So you made the decision all the way from Lithuania, and as you said, you grew up by humble means, uh, it, it, it must have seemed impossible that you would ever get accepted into Berkeley and then thrive and succeed there. Absolutely. I still cannot believe that happened. <laughs> I feel like my whole life is just, is just like I won a jackpot or something. I just, I think about it, I work hard for it, but, but then I cannot believe that actually happened. I cannot believe that I actually created a life for myself in New York City. Um, and uh, when someone just mentioned that idea, how about you go to Berkeley? And I said, no way, it's like, there's no way I can get accepted or find the means for it. But secretly, as you know, the whole situation passed, the person left, I secretly went on, you know, on Google and I Googled Berkeley College of Music and I checked out the dates and I'm like, how about I just try just to try audition? It. <laughs> just try, the hope, the hope, right? You still have the linger, even though with, sort of objective thinking, you, that's not possible. At that time, we were still on our local currency, which is Litas. The money is like completely yeah, different. Yeah. But, but I, like one thing at a time, I always try to use this uh, uh, parallel of a, with a car, right? When we drive, we see just certain amount of light. So we don't see like all, you know, 50 kilometers or miles away. We see just a little bit but we get from A to B. So that's why I always try to remind myself, like I see just a little bit and I trust and I have hope and I keep continuing and I will get from A to B as long as I know what B is. <laughs> <laughs> Simona, that, that's actually great because uh, you came here, like you said, not knowing what your future would hold. And, and the reason why I wanted you to come in and share your story is because it's a powerful narrative about someone born and raised in Lithuania, plays the conklas, which is uh, an amazing instrument. We're gonna show people some of the work that you do. Uh, I just find it refreshing that you had this hope and now you came here to America spreading that hope uh, and, and you saw your hope fulfilled. That, that's an amazing story. Thank you, thank you so much and I'm glad you see it this way, but uh, it's kind of, you know, it's not a goal, it's not a destination, it's a journey. It's a journey, so it's exactly. constantly evolving, and there's a lot of work to do in this world. And you know, it was not easy. <laughs> no, no, sometimes I just want to cry thinking about the past, but, uh, but we did overcame it. Yeah, yeah well, well, let's talk about the past a little mm -hmm. bit, because you mentioned that you grew up uh, poor, and, and, and there are many people, even in this country, who have grown up poor. There are many, I mean, look, America is made up of a melting pot of people from all backgrounds, wealthy, uh, middle class, poor. Uh, they're, they're from different countries. Uh, we're just a melting pot of people, a melting pot of humanity that comes together. And, and the one thing I love about this show is that we try to find that common ground mm -hmm. that exposes our common good to help each other. So let's, let's talk about your past a little bit. Well, there's a lot of bumpy moments. Uh, first, I guess the very beginning, I was raised in a farm. Uh, my dad used to be a veterinarian. We had a lot of animals, and that was after uh, Soviet Union collapse. So that was a very different regime, the change of regimes. I was also born at a very specific time when the re revolution started. That's why I'm such a rebellious baby. <laughs> And for people who are from the Baltic states, they might be familiar with that term. It's when we went out to the streets and to the highways and we sang, we didn't have weapons, we sang for our freedom, right? And okay, that that's, that's amazing. <laughs> that's why I wanted you to share this story. Yeah. So I didn't mean to interrupt, but let's, let's look at that for a moment. You sang a revolution. You didn't have weapons that were like, you know, guns and, and bullets. You sang a revolution. Yeah. Please explain to us what that was like. 
It's manifestation of music, it's the power of music. We use the means we have, and that was our singing and unity. People would gather together for nights and days, and they would just burn bonfires and hold hands. I get goosebumps when I talk about it. Yeah. We have this uh, phenomenon which is called Baltic Way or Baltic Chain, where people uh, stood in 1989, in August actually, which is, <laughs> that's the month. So families, children, women and men stood across three Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, without interruption, standing through the highway connecting all three countries and just singing for the whole day, showing the world, not only Soviet Union, but the world, that we are independent countries and we have our identity and we are strong and everybody is here, children and adults. And this is so powerful. I wish I could have been there, but I was just one years old. <laughs> That's right. But you, your family has passed that on to you. Yeah. Do, do they ever sing some of those songs to you? No, actually, that's a that's a sadder part. I never really got that from family that much, but I, I did get that a lot of school in school. In school. Like, yeah, from teachers, from friends. And since I played the national instrument, so I had to learn all the folk songs in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that kind of came to me through, through schooling, definitely. So revolutionary beginnings and very unstable times in the country. Obviously, it was very hard for us, too. And then... We pretty much lacked all the time. Then mom raised us two by herself and uh, and we liked every single thing. I honestly, when I think about it, it's kind of uh, funny, but not funny that my first album is called The Hunger Artist. But when I think of a uh, hunger, actually, I think that from the beginning until like 18, I was actually constantly hungry all the time. Mm. It was like a normal state to me. Mm. And I remember all these moments where you are being isolated, like you play with the kids on the playground and at a certain time, at 6 p.m., everybody got called by their parents to eat dinner, but I wasn't called, right? And now I can say it with a light heart because, you know, I've done my work. <laughs> yeah. But uh, there are a certain amount of time where it was hard to own that story because there's shame attached to it, right? Although as a baby, as a kid, you don't really carry you it. Don't but see it, yeah. But yeah, but now I feel like there's power, and it's actually it's like this chamber of source of power when you owning your story, right? And I own it that it was hard. I was left alone. All the kids going for dinner, I'm not going for dinner. All the kids going for field trips, Mona is not going to field trips. But I found my way of being resilient even as a kid, and I found my outlet, which is also music and arts, which I loved, and it kept me really focused, and it created a life for me. So it was hard from the beginning, and when I moved to the U.S., it was even harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> even yeah. harder. So there's a lot of uh, stories, you know, of like not having phone for half a year. One time I came to the class. This one, everybody loves the stories. When um, my shoes started breaking on the way to the class, oh, wow. but breaking this that way that, you know, you you really can't walk. So I'm like, okay. What's my options? Option one, go to the uh, student's activity center or sort of like a um, office and tape it. Two, go home. Three, go barefoot. <laughs> so I'm like, well, how about taping? <laughs> so I go and I tape those shoes and I go and specifically the day the class was in circle and everybody's sitting and I'm with the taped shoes and I'm so embarrassed. And this was at Berkeley? This was at Berkeley. In Boston. <laughs> in you Boston. have taped shoes and, yes, and, and yes. how did they respond? Well, the girl next to me said, I like how you taped your shoes. I think Professor uh, uh, try to show that he doesn't see it. <laughs> yeah, it was very embarrassing. I had many, many of those stories, but I always try to keep reminding myself that I chose it, right? No one pushed me to this. I chose it. I came it, and I know that everything great in this world comes with a price. Am I willing to pay it? I am willing to pay it. And it was very hard. First three years, it was really hard, but then it got better, and now it's really good. Now. That's fantastic. <laughs> We're going to take a slight break. I'm talking to Simona Smirnova of Lithuania, and just an incredible story of her resiliency as well as her uh, ability to turn pain into power. And when we come back, we'll talk more about her passion for music and the wonderful instrument that she plays. That's next on America's Hope. Welcome back to America's Hope. I'm Kelly Wright. I'm sitting with uh, a very talented lady, uh, Simona Smirnova, uh, born in Lithuania. 
saw her family go through a cultural revolution and a real revolution to break away from uh, the tyranny of the Soviet Union. And you were just one at the time, but the story has been handed down to you to know what Lithuanians and other people from your from the Baltic states actually went through. And now we see the, the, the unrest going on with Ukraine and, and Soviet Union, or actually Russia now. Uh, and, and I think it's good that we remind people around the world what, what was at stake back then, freedom. And what's at stake now? Freedom for the Ukrainian people as well as for, the, for people who are uh, in, enduring that, uh, that type of uh, pain and, and warfare. When you look at that and you see America responding in such a way in terms of supporting uh, Ukrainians, uh, the Ukrainian area, do you have any feeling about what you're seeing? Well, I do see, especially when I witnessed the NATO summit in Lithuania, I was at the same time. But also at the same time, it's not really my area of expertise right. to comment on this, I would say. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's a very wise decision. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, uh, with all that you've been through, and now you're doing your music around the world, you're teaching uh, the conclus to, to people who want to know how to play, this, this unusual instrument that was uh, created in your country. Talk to me about that instrument at, because it has a, a great sound and I actually watched you play it during the national anthem. In fact, let's, let's take a moment and we'll watch you presenting the national anthem uh, in Washington, D.C. on the National Mall. Let's watch. You know, that's a powerful presentation of the national anthem using your own uh, native instrument to Lithuania and then singing as well. So not only are you gifted musically in terms of playing your instrument, but you also use your instrument, which is your voice. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that night like for you, singing the national anthem? Oh, I felt so honored. Really, I, I just wanted to cry. <laughs> I felt like I cannot believe I'm doing it. And you know, as an artist, we prepare songs if it's, let's say, if it's not our composition, we try to make it dear to us, think about what it really means. And every artist before they go on stage, they think like, how do I want to make people feel about it, right? So different songs have different feelings, but this is the national anthem. So it's very different. So it brings the sense of unity and pride, right? This is what anthems, we stand together as a nation, we are together. And I thought about it, and with this opportunity to sing the Star Spangled Banner, I actually again thought how grateful I am for my life in the United States, and how many great opportunities have given me, and one of them is being free, being myself. Mm. Because as I mentioned before, like in Lithuania, with a lot of times I would s stick out a little bit, and, uh, and here I felt so always and continuously feeling welcomed and being myself. So when I sang that anthem, I felt like 
my gratitude with my talents I can honor this country and I can share that and I think people really felt it they really felt it and I felt that electricity in the when I say room but that was arena so <laughs> yeah. a big room <laughs> a big room yeah uh, well it was a wonderful night for you and there have been many since then uh, musically as you stated earlier in the previous segment you have four albums and uh, you're currently working on a new one I wanted to ask you specifically about one album uh, Joan of Arc, what gave you the impetus uh, to do that one? It came sort of natural, in a natural way. Uh, I was looking for the next thing to do and I always loved uh, visuals, like movies. And one of friend of mine, um, he owned uh, like a gallery where they would do screenings and he just offered it to me. He said, we do silent film screenings. Would you be interested in composing a score for a silent film screening? And that was the silent film from 1928, I want to say, uh, The Passion of Joan of Arc. So I, at that moment, I haven't seen the movie. I watched it. I couldn't believe what I've seen it because it's so ahead of its time. It's beautiful. And it was very hard because it's very emotional. But I, I said yes, and I did compose the score, and then I started performing it. And I'm, from that point, I was moving from Boston to New York, so I started showing it in New York. Uh, I showed it in Maine. Um, and I kept showing, and I really felt like it's a very strong project for people to come and see the movie while I'm conducting a string quartet and singing along with it and you know there's a live score to it. It's also a very special experience to conduct and create a live score right away in the real time. But then when the COVID happened uh, I wasn't able to perform so I was thinking that I have this whole score which is not used right now so how about I'm recording it. So I just used that score which was performed at first into more of a thematic um, system and uh, so people can actually when they listen to it see and follow John's trial and suffering so it's a very very sad but also at the same time so dear and so hopeful to me because Joan gave hope to many many people ahead of her many women in the future and to me and that sort of like uh, gentle and strong at the same time qualities mm -hmm. merge together mm -hmm. and I love that I feel like I'm this way too like I'm so uh, uh, sensitive in a way and and my heart is so big for each animal and each bug and each plant and but at the same time strong I yeah. overcome things I go strongly with discipline and power so just just like John so I think there is a personal touch to it of, of course as of well. course there is and, and you know you're you're uh, you're still young, you have the world ahead of you. What's your message to young Americans? Well, I think we are already great in being free and uh, welcoming other people, uh, di their differences, the way they are. I think um, my message is for to care for the planet. That's the main thing, to really be cautious and mindful about the consumption we do, the everyday things we do, and really care for for the air, for the water, for the indigenous species, educate ourselves about it. It's very important. We have just one home, and yeah. it's our planet. You know, you raise that issue, and, and of course, uh, that's, that's what a lot of young people are concerned about, uh, climate. They're concerned about the indigenous species. Uh, so many uh, species have the, are, are actually on an endangered species list. Uh, we've seen the wildfires uh, in mm -hmm. Canada. We've seen the wildfires in California. And of course, the firestorm that has taken place uh, decimating and incinerating uh, Lahaina in, in uh, Maui, in Hawaii. Uh, as we see these natural disasters uh, creep on us and happen at a more rapid pace, uh, I think it's good that you're making music about the planet, making people be aware of how they can better safeguard the planet. What's next for you? So the next, I feel like I'm a very joyous transitional mode. Uh, I always loved visual aspects like costumes and colors and dance. So I've had these four albums and the Kankles book, but I feel like the next album will be very sparkly and it will be like Ode to Joy almost. It will be a part of Joyful Simona. So it will be more dance, uh, celebrating live joy, celebrating connection with other people and just 
being happy and uh, playful. And so and with that, you're presenting a concert, I understand. Yes, yes, yes. When is that is, taking place? Which I would love to invite everyone to come. It's on October 18th uh, at the Cutting Room in Manhattan. Wonderful, wonderful. And, and the Conklis, uh, we want to leave people with a good visual of what, uh, what the Conklis can do when you're just playing jazz. And uh, we want to thank you for being a guest on America's Hope and dropping by to give us a full measure of hope. We appreciate you so much. Thank you so much. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs>